Imagine yourself every day in a cage like an animal. You will not go back to France until you've told me the truth. I'm going to spoil your life as you have spoiled mine. I'm going to kill you, okay? Be quick! Sophie Lyon was born in France in 1996 when she was very young. Her parents divorced, her mother remarried, and as a result of this relationship, she had another child. Sophie grew up in the countryside east of Paris with her mother, stepfather, younger brother, and older stepsister. She was a very simple, quiet, and shy girl. She didn't like to interact with others much, had few friends, and even found it difficult to talk to her own family. According to her mother, she often tried to talk to her daughter, ask about her day, what she learned in school, and so on. However, Sophie mostly responded with short phrases or one-word sentences. There were times when she talked more about what she did during the day and how she felt, but it was relatively rare. However, Sophie got along very well with children. She enjoyed being around them and was able to maintain very good relationships with them. She seemed happy, and it was evident that this was her favorite thing to do. So, after finishing middle and high school, Sophie studied early childhood education, hoping to find work related to children. She started looking for such opportunities, but couldn't find anything she liked or that was specifically related to children. So, Sophie began working as a cashier in a supermarket because she needed to financially support her family. She didn't want to remain unemployed, and while she was searching for an opportunity to do what she truly enjoyed, she thought it was a good option. After some time, she found a job listing thanks to a friend. A family in London was looking for a nanny who spoke French to look after their two young children, a six-year-old boy and a three-year-old girl. The couple consisted of Sabrina Quidir and Wissam Bajuni, whom everyone called Sam. Sabrina was involved in the fashion world in London and worked as a makeup artist for celebrities. Sam, on the other hand, had been a financial analyst at a bank but had already quit his job by the time they sought a nanny. He had used his savings to buy two apartments that the family rented out. They lived in a prestigious area of London, and their financial situation was very good, maintaining a high standard of living. Sophie saw this as the perfect job. She would practice her English, which she had been studying, and take care of two children, which was what she wanted to do. At first, her mother didn't want to let her go, saying it wasn't a good idea to travel far to a foreign country with strangers. However, Sophie's determination was so great that her parents eventually agreed to let her take the job. In January 2016, when Sophie was only 20 years old, she arrived in London. In the first months of her stay in London and throughout the year 2016, Sophie was very content with this family and was happy with the children. Neighbors living nearby said they saw in her a girl who was very dedicated to her work. Of course, in London, she had very little social life. There were many nanas who would get together on weekends to socialize. They also interacted with each other when they took the children to the park or school, but Sophie always kept her distance. She was very engrossed in her work. Sophie was supposed to return home to France in September 2017. But in May 2017, she wrote a letter to her mother stating that she was no longer happy with the family she worked for. According to Sophie, Sabrina accused her of stealing from her, reduced her salary, didn't allow her to go anywhere, and didn't give her the allotted time off. So, Sophie's mother bought her a plane ticket and sent it to her, but Sophie didn't use the ticket. For the next few weeks, almost nothing was heard from Sophie, although in previous months, she had been very communicative with her family, sending postcards, letters, and emails. Over time, these messages became less frequent, and her parents became very worried about her. On Wednesday, September 20, 2017, a barbecue was being prepared in the backyard of Sabrina and Sam's house. The problem with this barbecue was that the smell began to become quite strange, and moreover, the smoke coming from the family's garden was too strong. Some neighbors knocked on the door and found Sam alone. 
He said he was grilling chicken and lamb and assured them not to worry because there was always too much smoke when he barbecued, as he didn't know how to use it properly. However, one of the neighbors didn't believe this and called the fire department. Everyone was afraid that the fire would spread to neighboring houses or that someone would be poisoned by the smoke. When the firefighters arrived, they went inside and asked Sam what he was doing. One of the photos showed that he was grilling chicken. The firefighters found it very strange that such strong smoke was coming from chicken and lamp, so they examined the remains on the grill. When they looked closely, they saw fingers and what seemed to be a nose. They called the police, and these bones turned out to be human remains. At that moment, Sam was taken into custody and sent to the police station. As he was being transported, more law enforcement personnel arrived. The street was completely blocked, and the neighbors started wondering what could have happened. Suddenly, the police brought out something that looked like a body covered with tarpaulin from the garden. A few days later, it was confirmed that it was the body of Sophie Lyon, who was 21 years old at the time. Sam and Sabrina were both arrested and the months of torture and suffering that the young Frenchwoman had endured in this couple's home were revealed. As usual, a forensic examination was conducted to determine the cause of death, the day of death, and what had really happened to Sophie. Initially, it was assumed to be murder, a conclusion confirmed by the examination. Sophie had several fractures of the sternum, ribs, clavicle, and jaw, and these fractures were several days old. Unfortunately, the exact cause of Sophie's death couldn't be determined 100% because her body had been severely burned. It was also impossible to determine the day of her death. It didn't take much effort to understand that Sam and Sabrina were clearly responsible for her death. Now, it was necessary to find out what had happened and how it had occurred in order to begin the legal process and bring justice to Sophie, who deserved it. Following the results of the forensic examination, two days after the discovery of the body, Sabrina and her husband Sam were charged with the murder of Sophie Lyon. The trial revealed much about the conditions in which Sophie had lived in her last few months in London. Much attention was paid to Sabrina's personality. Sabrina, like Sophie, started her career as a nanny. Afterward, she began working as a makeup artist and became involved in the fashion world in London working with celebrities. She had a son with the singer Mark Walton, who was a member of a boy band at the time. They fell in love, dated, and had a son, Sabrina's older child, whom Sophie took care of. In 2013, their relationship ended and they broke up. Mark told Sabrina that he didn't want anything to do with her, which led to a complete change in Sabrina's personality. According to several people who knew her since she started dating Mark, she became very unstable, behaved strangely, had several episodes of anger, and often became angry with people without any apparent reason. Sabrina also began to stalk Mark, knowing where he was, calling him constantly, and wanting to remain part of his life, but he repeatedly rejected her. While she was still obsessed with Mark, she began a relationship with Sam. Sam and Sabrina had known each other for many years, and after a few months of their relationship, Sabrina became pregnant. She moved into Sam's apartment, where their daughter was born, and where Sophie lived later. As the girl grew up a bit, they decided to hire a nanny to help them. Externally, Sabrina and Sam's life seemed perfect, but in reality, they had many problems. As I mentioned earlier, Sam worked as a financial analyst at a bank, he quit his job because Sabrina told him that he spent too much time at work and there was not enough time for the family. However, when Sam left his job, their income, apparently, became less than what Sabrina was used to. She wanted to go to dinners with celebrity, buy expensive dresses, and while she could afford a relatively luxurious life thanks to her own work, she wanted more and more. Furthermore, for many years, she continued to pursue Mark. Sabrina had reached the point where she had concocted the idea that her ex, Mark Walton, was a child abuser, an exploiter of people, and just a very bad person in general. Clearly, she had no evidence of any of this, and all the accusations were deemed false. In 2017, Mark Walton decided to move from London to the USA. When Sabrina found out about this, she became very angry. 
He was in America, and she was in London, and she could no longer control him, didn't know where he was or who he was with. Sabrina couldn't keep tabs on him, couldn't stalk him, or call him like she had done for the past few years. And so, she began venting all her anger on Sophie. At first, Sabrina accused her of things like stealing from the house. She also told her that she didn't do things on time, that she cooked poorly, that she was always late picking up the kids from school, anything just to have an excuse to treat her poorly and yell at her. Soon, the verbal insults escalated into physical violence. It was revealed that not only Sabrina, but also Sam had repeatedly beaten Sophie. They kicked her, slapped her, beat her with cords, and the girl began to suffer greatly. In addition, they deprived her of food, didn't allow her to bathe, and even cut her salary. According to several people who had seen Sophie in recent months, she always wore the same clothes, was very unkempt, didn't maintain hygiene, all because these people didn't give her the opportunity to live a normal life. Sophie's free time was also restricted, and to some extent, she was locked in the house, only going out to take the kids to school, pick them up, take them to sports classes, and do shopping for the family. After that, she was completely isolated from the world. Sabrina even repeatedly prohibited her from talking to her family. The court presented recordings that helped confirm this. On these recordings, made with Sam and Sabrina's mobile devices, you can hear them verbally abusing Sophie, as well as physically assaulting her. Imagine yourself every day in a cage like an animal. You will not go back to France until you've told me the truth. I'm going to spoil your life as you have spoiled mine. I'm going to kill you, okay? Be quick! You better know that we will not let you go back until we know the whole, whole, whole truth. Nothing but the truth. In addition to the audio recordings, photos were found on all the family's electronic devices, computers, and phones, showing how Sophie changed over time, becoming thinner and more emaciated. She was already quite slim before, but in this last photo that you are now seeing on your screens, she looked very awful. Obviously, Sophie was not healthy, neither physically nor emotionally. According to the girl's mother, when she saw her daughter's photo, it reminded her of people who had been in concentration camps. Sophie endured several months of torture, but she remained silent out of fear of Sabrina, as her mother claimed that she had repeatedly threatened her. The woman threatened to send her to prison, harm her parents, and much more. She even claimed that Sophie had a secret relationship with Mark Walton, and that she let him into the house when no one was there. Sabrina wanted so badly to destroy her ex-partner that she forced Sophie to write a letter in which she allegedly confessed to having a secret relationship with Mark Walton. And all of this happened because he made her do it and promised her roles in movies and TV series in exchange for a sexual relationship. Obviously, this was impossible. Mark Walton didn't even know about Sophie's existence and moved several months after her arrival in London. As I mentioned earlier, the exact date of Sophie's death was not known from the autopsy results, but thanks to the investigation and what was said in court, it became somewhat clear when this happened. According to the prosecution's version, it was the evening of September 19. Several surveillance cameras captured Sabrina and Sam on September 20 when the body was found by the barbecue. You can see Sam taking the children to school that morning. Then, after classes, Sabrina took them to a small playground. It seemed like she deliberately delayed coming home. Sam also went to the grocery store to do some shopping. Sophie usually took care of all these tasks. That's why they hired her. Therefore, prosecutors believe that Sophie was already dead at that time. It can also be assumed that there was a certain premeditation in the murder. Sabrina was texting one of her friends, and this friend asked her if Sophie had any friends who would be willing to work for her, cook, walk the dogs, do house cleaning, and spend time with her daughter. Sabrina replied that Sophie no longer worked for them and hinted in the message that things had not ended well. This happened on September 15, five days before the police arrested Sabrina and her husband. Regarding their testimonies, they both accused each other. 
Sabrina told the story that on the night of September 19th, she went to sleep. Sam was arguing with Sophie because she hadn't prepared dinner the way he wanted and had done it wrong. Sabrina went to sleep and didn't hear anything more about the argument. According to her, when she woke up in the middle of the night, she heard noise in the bathroom. It was Sam drowning Sophie. Sabrina told the authorities that she couldn't save the girl because when she entered the bathroom, Sophie was already almost dead. Sam told the same story, but in his version, the person who argued with and drowned Sophie was not him, but Sabrina. They both told the same story, blaming each other. Then, the prosecution brought in a crucial witness, Sabrina and Mark Walton's son, the eldest child in the house. The boy said that on the night of September 19th, he heard Sabrina and Sam arguing with Sophie, and then both of them took her to the bathroom, and he heard the nanny screaming for help. Thanks to this testimony, the prosecution was able to establish that Sophie's death occurred on September 19th, and that Sam and Sabrina drowned her in the bathroom. As I mentioned earlier, although they didn't plan it, Sabrina to some extent already knew that it might happen, which is why she was telling her friends that Sophie no longer worked for them. After hearing witness testimony, audio recordings, and the timeline of the case, everything was in the hands of the jurors, who, after deliberating for 30 hours, delivered their verdict. Sam and Sabrina were found guilty of the murder of Sophie Lyon and sentenced to 30 years in prison. Sabrina even wrote a supposed farewell letter to Sophie, in which she wished her to be in a better place. For Sophie's friends, family, and acquaintances, this was a mockery, and it was evident that Sabrina felt no remorse for taking Sophie's life. It is unknown, or at least I couldn't find information about the custody of the two children. It's possible that it was not disclosed to the public. However, we can only hope that they are with people who love them, nurture them, and help them cope with this difficult time, as they were repeatedly witnesses to the cruel treatment of their mother and father towards Sophie. It's often said that life's greatest treasures come at no cost. Embraces, companions, loved ones, affection, and just when you believe you possess it all, treachery can strike in an instant. Betrayal is incredibly devious. It can tear you away from your most joyous time, plunging you to the depths of a dark chasm in a mere moment. The tale of a certain Chinese duo concluded with disloyalty, but as it transpired, the bleakest was still on the horizon. In June 2019, a Chinese duo opted for a brief getaway at a national park in Thailand. Both were fluent in Thai, having resided in the country for a while. The spouse, 32-year-old Wan Nan, was three months expectant at the time. Thus, the couple chose to take a respite from life's pressures and simply relish the outdoors. They were anticipating a baby, so picture the husband's emotions when his pregnant wife plummeted from a cliff, a hundred feet high, comparable to the height of an eight-story apartment complex. Ambulances rushed to the location promptly. The husband was beside himself, yelling and pushing past emergency personnel who were attempting to rescue his wife. Tears poured down his face as he pleaded to save the baby and couldn't compose himself. At one moment, in desperation, he grasped his wife's hand and leaned close to her face. Astonishingly, she was still breathing and alert, unable to speak or move, in a state of shock but cognizant of everything. The husband ran his hand over her face, over her cheeks, and whispered something in Chinese, unintelligible to anyone else. There were no surveillance cameras on the cliff, and the rescuers spoke Thai. Abruptly, the man's demeanor shifted, and in a voice filled with rage, he muttered through gritted teeth, If she doesn't want to perish, she should behave. A minute later, he snapped out of it. His eyes softened, his voice changed. Frantically, he continued to implore the doctors to rescue his precious wife and unborn child because without them, he saw no purpose to live. The woman had 17 bone fractures throughout her body. Even her eyes were at risk because the skin around them was severely swollen. Doctors feared they wouldn't be able to preserve her vision, but fortunately, they did. Every part of her body resembled a delicate shard of glass that specialists tried hard to put back together. According to the X-ray, she looked like a porcelain vase shattered against a wall. She was very fortunate to be alive and miraculously saved her unborn child. 
It was lucky that the fall from the height was cushioned by the branches of the trees. Due to her critical condition and pregnancy, the patient was connected to life support equipment. For the first few days, she couldn't even speak and periodically lost consciousness. It all seemed like a feverish dream. When she woke up and couldn't remember where she was, tubes and wires protruded from her body. Memories of the fall from the cliff and excruciating pain slowly resurfaced in her mind. As she calmed down, the woman began to look around the hospital room and noticed her husband in the corner of the room. Her heart rate increased, machines began to beep, and consciousness left her once again. The man watched her intently from his seat, sometimes approaching to caress her hair as she lay strapped to the hospital bed, running his fingers over her cheeks. Extreme fury reflected in his eyes. The woman gazed into her husband's face and didn't recognize him. It felt like it was someone else, not the person she had known for a long time. There was an impression that he was obsessed with some dark thoughts and intentions. Since Juan couldn't move or speak, she spent most of her days just reliving the incident over and over again, staring at the ceiling of the room, unable to comprehend how this could have happened to her. In the beginning of June 2019, a married couple embarked on a weekend getaway to a national park in Thailand. The expectant wife had some reservations about hiking in the mountains given her condition, but her husband reassured her by mentioning a trail where they could simply stroll, inhale the fresh mountain air, and gain new experiences, which would be good for their unborn child. However, upon arriving at the national park, the situation was not as anticipated. Typically, this location was bustling with visitors and tourists, which provided a sense of security, but also added a touch of levity, knowing that you were not alone in these forested cliffs, and if anything unusual occurred, someone would be close by. As the sun vanished behind the clifftops and darkness started to envelop the surroundings, the environment took on a grayish, hazy appearance. Before the couple noticed, all the other park visitors had dispersed. Juan began to glance around anxiously and worry that a predatory animal might be prowling in the woods. She started urging her husband to return to the hotel. The man, in an excited state, despite claiming to have a long-standing fear of heights, climbed to the edge of the cliff. He exclaimed that it was even more romantic this way, but yielding to his wife's entreaties, agreed to depart from the park. Nevertheless, on the final day of the weekend, the husband once again persuaded his wife to venture into nature. He discovered a secret spot on the internet from where they could observe the sunrise amidst the mountains, persuading his wife that with the arrival of their baby, they wouldn't have the chance to visit such places for an extended period. The man set the alarm for 3 o'clock in the morning. The following day, at 3.30, the couple departed from the hotel and made their way to the mountaintop and the same national park they had visited the previous day. Juan observed that her husband was pensive throughout the journey, and then, unexpectedly, he inquired if she had any regrets in life. The woman reflected. At this point, she was at the pinnacle of her thriving career, and her husband had been working diligently to prepare their home for the baby's arrival. Perhaps there were things she regretted, but now they all seemed trivial. Thus, Juan smiled at her husband and expressed that she wouldn't want to alter anything in her life. They continued to ascend higher and higher until they reached a small natural platform off the trail. The husband explained that this was the secret spot where some locals enjoyed watching the sunrise, and it was also popular because from the top, you could see ancient rock paintings left by ancient civilizations. As they approached the edge to peer down and see the well-preserved relics of the past, one, not noticing any signs of human presence around, thought it was very perilous and wanted to turn back. However, her husband, who suffered from acrophobia, disregarded her words and courageously continued to walk forward towards the edge of the cliff. Worried for his safety, Juan implored him to return to the trail, but the man seemed not to hear her. He approached the edge and calmly admired the view. Everything around was truly breathtakingly beautiful. The sun painted the cliffs orange, and the air felt too fresh for a hot June day in Thailand. Juan slowed down and cautiously approached her husband standing behind him admiring the sunrise. 
The spouse turned around, embraced her, and kissed her cheek tightly. The woman smiled happily. This moment would be remembered forever for the rest of her life. The two of them embraced in the rays of the rising sun on the mountainside in Thailand. In their marriage, there were ups and downs, but that's what love is all about. These moments were supposed to become the main memories for them. The husband leaned his face against her hair and then touched her ear with his lips and whispered softly, Die. Then the man pushed his pregnant wife off the cliff over 100 feet high. This was the scene that Juan replayed in her head again and again, lying on the hospital bed. Unable to speak, unable to leave, she lay there and watched her husband, who sat in the corner of the room with undisguised disgust. Then she heard the door to the room open, and the nurse entered. The husband's face immediately softened. He stopped being the angry guard in the corner of her room and instantly turned into a loving spouse, worried about his wife and child. Van attempted to convey to the nurses through her gaze that they should remove this man from the room as he was the one who had pushed her off the cliff. Otherwise, he might try to end her life again. However, the staff misunderstood her. They smiled and remarked that Van was very fortunate to have such a caring and loving husband. They were unaware that on the very first day, he had tried to disconnect the life support system to silence his wife once and for all. The most bewildering aspect was that Van truly did not anticipate anything terrible happening in her family life. In her view, they had almost perfect relationships lately. Prior to him pushing her off the cliff, her husband had never raised a hand to her or been unfaithful. One of the main things was that she didn't even want to date this man initially. Van Nan simply didn't have time for friends, let alone romantic partners. This young woman was so determined and ambitious that as soon as she graduated from university with a degree in business development, she immediately got down to work. Van went from being an assistant at a tourist agency to an operations manager in record time. She was sent to Thailand to establish a branch there. Essentially, she built it from the ground up in a foreign country, almost without knowing the language. Then Vam left the tourist agency and started her own business. She tried many different things before starting her own company. The young woman opened a Chinese restaurant and organized accommodation for Chinese citizens coming to Thailand. And only then did she realize the need to learn the Thai language. At the beginning of her career, Van slept only three, four hours a day and was completely focused on making a name for herself. Starting at the age of 20, the girl worked without sleep or rest, and by the time she turned 30, it paid off. She succeeded, and her own capital surpassed $3 million. Van had a huge influence on the Chinese community in Thailand. There were many Chinese citizens who wanted to do business in this country, and they all turned to Van Man for assistance. The young woman didn't go on a date for about 10 years because she was completely focused on her work. But sometimes she felt a little lonely in her apartment. One day during a business event in May 2017, Van heard someone among the guests speaking her native dialect. The girl immediately felt a pleasant feeling of home comfort. She showed a little attention to this young man named Yu Shia Adun. A conversation ensued between them. But then Van remembered that she was at work and scolded herself for being unserious. After that, she stopped the conversation and dismissed the guy from her mind. However, those few minutes were enough for him to fall in love, or at least show serious interest in the girl. The young man found Van on social media and tried to add her as a friend, but she rejected his attempt, sparking even more curiosity. He couldn't stop thinking about her and continued to assert himself until the girl gave in. Yu invited Vam to dinner, attended Thai language lessons with her, and when she started to miss home, he traveled several miles to the market to buy Chinese products and cook her homemade food reminiscent of Nanjing. They had been dating for about a month, when one early morning, Van received a lengthy message from him professing his love. He said that he had been searching for a beautiful, educated girl with a successful career who could provide the best for their future child. And then he wrote that he wanted to take care of her for the rest of their lives and grow old together. The girl realized that she was comfortable with this person. He was calm, responsible, and could potentially be a good husband in the future. 
but she didn't take him seriously because the guy was completely different from her. They had only recently started dating, although the romance present in the long message appealed to her. Van got out of bed, washed up, and got ready for work. She didn't feel any excitement about being confessed to, and she wondered why he would send such a lengthy message in the middle of the night while she was sound asleep. Dismissing all the emotionally charged proposals from her mind, Van headed to work, opened the door, and recoiled. Yu was standing outside her apartment. As it turned out, the guy had sent the message and, not waiting for a response, came to her door. He didn't want to disturb her sleep and simply sat outside the entrance for a few hours, waiting for her to wake up. He was such a hopeless romantic. Then Yu invited the girl to the beach, where they rented two horses and simply enjoyed each other's company. Van understood that if it were someone like her in his place, they wouldn't have time for all this romance. Both of them would work tirelessly to build successful careers. Two months passed in their relationship, which Van perceived as rather casual. The couple enjoyed a nice Saturday dinner when Yu declared that they needed to get married. They were both adults, both over 30, so why waste precious time? At first, the girl thought the guy was joking, but he continued to insist. To reason with him, she reminded him of the need to first introduce him to her parents. Her mother and father would be upset if they found out she got married without their approval. Yu considered all this to be mere formalities, since they could meet the parents later. He proposed going to the courthouse tomorrow. Van knew that the courthouse didn't work on Sundays, so she easily agreed, insisting that if the courthouse was closed, it meant it was too early for them to marry. She was 100% sure that's how it would turn out. The next morning, she still thought Yu was joking and decided to play along. The two of them headed to the courthouse, and against all logic, it turned out to be open. Most likely the guy paid someone, but Van genuinely believed it was some kind of sign. At that moment, she reasoned that she was already over 30, didn't have time to find a husband, and her parents had long dreamed of grandchildren. The girl convinced herself that if it happened like this, then it was meant to be. On that day, there were no rings, no wedding, no honeymoon. Their parents didn't even suspect that the children had married. Everything was sudden and very romantic. But as soon as the young couple signed the marriage certificate, everything turned upside down. Yu transformed from a hopeless romantic into the embodiment of a useless husband. Usually, when they spent the night together, their morning started with both jumping up, washing up, and each rushing off to their respective work. However, the day after they got married, when the alarm went off, Van began getting ready for work while her newlywed husband spayed in bed, grabbed his phone, and started playing games. Van was surprised, but didn't say anything. Perhaps her husband had a day off. However, when she returned home in the evening, he was still lying in bed, playing games on his phone. The girl was bewildered. She didn't want to start their life together with arguments. So in the following days, she just went to work, hoping that Yu would come to his senses and start embodying all the things he talked about before they got married. The guy simply lived under her roof, relying on her financially. He clung to her like a parasite, draining not only money, but also all her energy, love, and compassion. His tender attitude had disappeared. Previously, when Van needed help in her Chinese restaurant because of staff shortages, Yu usually pitched in, putting on an apron and tackling any task without hesitation. This was one of the qualities that Van genuinely liked about him. But now, when she asked him to come, he dragged himself to the restaurant, slouched in one of the customer chairs, ate free food, and played on his phone. He watched as she cleared tables and took orders but did nothing to help. There was one telling incident. Van was carrying a stack of dishes down the stairs from the storeroom slipped and almost fell from the top. Yu tore his gaze away from his phone, checked if his wife was bleeding, and then continued playing. He didn't even pretend to be concerned. The fall was so bad that they had to call an ambulance, but he didn't care. At first, Van tried to find excuses for her husband's behavior and felt guilty. After all, she had officially gotten married, and in the Chinese community, as everywhere else in the world, 
there was a stigma against divorce, especially at her age. She even blamed her success because she had read somewhere that a wife's success could be an irritating factor. But didn't he used to like her ambition? She still hoped he would change and become the caring guy she married. Gradually, Yu occasionally started doing household chores, taking out the trash, giving foot massages, and Van thought everything would improve. But then, he would lift his eyes from her feet, smirk, and ask if he could borrow a few thousand dollars, and with each time the amount increased. Eventually Vam got tired of it, and she directly asked her husband what he needed the money for. He wasn't paying rent, no longer working at his company, so he didn't need funds for business expansion. You confessed that he had a gambling debt of $140,000 hanging over him. The girl was shocked. Not only was her husband not working, but he also managed to get into debt because of his entertainment. Van couldn't understand what had happened to the guy who dreamed of becoming the CEO of his company. But what could she do? They hadn't signed a prenuptial agreement. His debts could ruin her business. You, like a child, began to whine about how menacing loan sharks were breathing down his neck and constantly reminding him about the money. The girl gave him a small lecture about how by gambling, he was destroying his own future. However, the guy continued to complain assuring that he would take responsibility as soon as he paid off the debts and would never return to it again. Once again, Van believed him and offered to pay off half of his debt so he could get back on his feet and earn money for the other half himself. She thought better of people than they deserved. She believed that Yu had fallen into a deep pit from which he couldn't climb out, so he lay in depression all this time. The wife even suggested that her husband manage one of the enterprises to settle with the creditors. From that day on, everything seemed to be improving, according to Van Man. Yu got very enthusiastic about his work, did everything possible to scale up the business into something bigger, expand it. But his desires lasted only a couple of weeks. One day, Yu said he had a meeting with a client for work and left early. Van was just about to leave the house when her accountant called and asked about the $700,000 she had just transferred from her account. The girl rushed to her purse and discovered that her wallet was missing. Also, her marriage certificates and identity card were missing from the folder with documents. Her husband fraudulently transferred money from her personal account, convincing the bank that it was their joint finances. Van stood there, not knowing how to feel. Her own husband had robbed her. After several failed attempts to reach him, the girl went to the police station and filed a report. What hurt the most was that Yu was the only person in the world who knew how much effort she had put into her work, how much she had sacrificed for the sake of her family's secure future, and yet despite all that, he betrayed her. And just before this incident, they had a very strong argument. Van Nan found out she was pregnant, happily shared the news with her husband, but instead of joy and excitement, she heard that he didn't want children right now and suggested she terminate the pregnancy or take care of the child herself. And then you left. The girl sat alone in her house, remembering the words of that long message written a month after they met. You talked about his dreams of starting a family, having children, raising them to be good people, how he would love a son and teach him martial arts, how he would take care of a little princess if they had a daughter. All those words turned out to be lies. Through the week, the police found Yu, and he confessed to stealing $700,000 from his wife and spending it on gambling. As soon as Van entered the interrogation room, Yu fell to his knees in front of her, begging for forgiveness, crying in front of the officers. He admitted that he came from a poor family and had always sought a better life. In the past, he had been sentenced to 12 years in prison for robbery, of which he served eight. He was released three years before meeting Van and lied about his entire life because he knew that women like her would never pay attention to a poor man. Yu pleaded for one last chance as their child would be born soon. He was a true manipulator. He knew exactly what buttons to push to make Van think and forgive him. The next morning, a new man woke up in her house. Yu got up earlier than his wife and started cleaning the apartment from top to bottom. He cooked healthy meals for pregnant women, massaged Van's tired legs and back, set up the nursery, and left little notes all over the apartment confessing his love for her and the baby. 
One evening, over dinner, Yu told his wife that he had been in touch with a relative working in an insurance company who advised them to take out life insurance since they would soon have a child, which was a very responsible step. Van was touched. Her hopeless romantic had returned. It was so touching that he talked to his relatives about the baby and asked for their advice. Her husband even took care of something that completely slipped her mind. But all of this was another lie. The perfect husband, the story about insurance, and even the newfound love for the future baby. Van realized this when she found herself at the foot of the cliff. She was unconscious for 40 minutes. Then her eyes got used to the bright light, and she saw the clouds in the sky. She even admired them for a moment until she felt excruciating pain all over her body. Van felt as if cold stones were piercing her skin. Her whole body ached as if she had been hit by a massive truck and then reversed and run over again. She tried to scream but couldn't. She was only alive thanks to the massive tree branches that slowed her fall onto the rocks. Otherwise, her husband would have gotten away with it, and he would have received millions of dollars from the insurance and her entire estate. She lay there, dying in agony, replaying her husband's last words in her head. Die. It was the only time he truly expressed his true feelings for her. Yu wandered around the cliff and waited for half an hour to make sure she was dead. Fortunately, Van lost consciousness and couldn't scream. She came to after he had already left. Early in the morning, there were still very few tourists in the park, but one of them accidentally strayed from the trail and got lost. He found himself at the foot of the cliff and noticed the girl. She couldn't move, but she felt someone holding her hand and shouting that she was safe. It was this tourist who called the rescue service. Yushia Adun was leaving the park area when an ambulance raced past him. He immediately guessed where they were headed, and when rescuers loaded Van onto a stretcher into the car, he rushed to them, crying out that this was his wife. He told the medics that his wife was pregnant and had felt dizzy. She had stepped off the trail to catch some fresh air and slipped off the cliff. He had been looking for her for about 30 minutes but couldn't find her since he didn't see where she fell. Then he leaned in close to Van's ear and whispered in Chinese that if she wanted to live, she had to behave. When authorities became interested in the case, Van had to lie that she really felt dizzy. Yu sat next to her, and she couldn't risk exposing herself to further danger. Later, with the help of nurses, she was able to talk to the police alone and tell them everything. Yu was arrested in March 2020, and that's when the trial began. Yu pleaded not guilty. He was very calm, almost indifferent, while authorities presented his motive. He was tried, but he appealed, leading to a second trial in Thailand. His mother tried to present her son as a wealthy businessman with a multi-million dollar business, even waving a business card from his company. She assured the judge that Yu was much richer than his wife and didn't need her money, but Yu Xia Adun's successful company only existed on a photoshopped business card. That's when it became clear who her son had become. Finally, on March 24, 2021, Yushia Adun was found guilty of attempting to murder his wife and was sentenced to life in prison. He was also ordered to pay $180,000 in compensation. Justice seemed to prevail, but at that time, Van had lost almost everything she had. She couldn't work for a long time because several steel plates had been inserted into her body. She couldn't bend her legs properly, and she had over 200 stitches. Her younger sister had to quit her job to become Van's caregiver. During her recovery, she received even worse news. Because of all the medication she had to take after the attack, her baby would not survive outside the womb, and if she tried to give birth, it would most likely lead to her own death. Van Nan lost her child, her husband, her independence, her career, and her faith in people. All of this happened at once. Unfortunately, doctors gave not very comforting forecasts. Many believed that Van would remain bedridden for the rest of her days. She had to undergo eight different surgeries, and for about a year, Van experienced continuous mental breakdowns. In early 2022, she rose from the depths and decided that enough tears had been shed. She was a successful woman and could achieve success again. In 2023, she launched social media, 
stood on her own two feet and no longer cried about what had happened. On her page, she warns women against making the mistake of joining their lives with the wrong person. Her example inspires and gives strength to others to never give up and move forward despite everything. Today I am going to tell you about a case that happened in a town in Costa Rica called Punta Arenas, a place that is chosen by thousands of people to spend their vacations on the beautiful beaches that this place offers. Costa Rica is a very popular tourist destination, but unfortunately there was no happy ending in this story. On July 18, 2020, Maria Luisa Sedino arrived at the La Mansion and Hotel in Manuel Antonio, located in the Costa Rican province of Punta Arenas. She arrived in the company of her pet dog named Mofolda, a small dog that accompanied her everywhere and whom she treated as her daughter. On the first day, nothing unusual happened. Maria Luisa went to the beach, ate lunch at a restaurant, drank some alcohol, all the things vacationers usually do. But the next day, everything changed. At exactly 16.30, Maria Luisa asked for a bottle of wine, mineral water, and two glasses to be brought to her room. It is worth noting that the woman did not tell anyone that she was going to go with someone, and everyone around her was sure that she needed to rest alone. Throughout the afternoon and evening, no movement was recorded from her room. The next day, July 20th, hotel staff tried to contact her but received no responses. A member of staff had previously spoken to Maria Luisa and she told him that she was living alone as she had recently split up with her partner, that she was not well, and that she was only traveling with her small dog Mofalda. As it had been several months since the pandemic had officially started, the woman said it had also affected her mental health, which was deteriorating. Considering everything she had been through in her life, she needed a vacation. So the hotel staff decided to enter the room to do a routine check just in case. The front door was locked from the inside. They then decided to see if there was access through the door that went out to the patio. This room had an emergency exit designed for guests with pets. They opened the patio door and the dog could go outside to relieve himself. When the hotel staff approached this exit, the door was half open. Once inside, they smelled a horrible odor and immediately saw bloodstains in various parts of the room. The dog was alive. He was lying in a corner, trembling with fear, and kept away from the hotel staff all the time apparently because it was either traumatized or very frightened. On the bed lay a motionless human figure wrapped in a sheet. This was how the lifeless body of Maria Luisa Sidneo had been discovered. Mary Louise Sidneo was an anesthesiologist and was an extremely respected specialist in her field. She was 43 years old at the time of her death and worked as the head of the Department of Anesthesiology and Rehabilitation at SEMA Hospital in Iskasu. She was much loved by her colleagues, and during the first part of the Mary Louise pandemic, she was very dedicated to her profession and wanted to help patients during those difficult times. The woman, being a medical professional, helped her loved ones a lot in this matter. She arranged health insurance, helped with medical appointments, and was sort of the right hand of the side the O family. When she could help with anything, she was always there for them. Her parents lived in Fortunata de San Carlos, so it wasn't always possible to be with her family all the time. Friends described Maria Luisa as a strong, intelligent, likable woman who loved to travel both in Costa Rica and abroad. Her reputation was truly impeccable. When news of her violent death reached Costa Rica and her own family, the aftermath was devastating. Who would want to kill someone like Maria Luisa? The mysteries of this case began from the first minute the staff discovered the lifeless body. The crime scene was disconcerting, not only because of the brutality encountered by Maria Luisa, but also because of the intrigue that began the moment she accessed the room she had rented at this hotel. Let's move on to the details discovered in this case. A third hotel room in Costa Rica. First, let's talk about access. This hotel, like most hotels around the world, keeps a record of the magnetic keys used in the rooms. In other words, every time someone enters the room, the card used is recorded and the code of the key used is known. In this way, it would be possible to know whether it was a customer or an employee of the hotel. In this case, in the Maria Luisa murder case, there was no record of access by keys that did not belong to the woman. It only transpired that she had entered her room the night before and no one else had entered. Obviously, since there was a sliding glass door at the back, someone could have entered through it. This door was always locked from the inside, so only the guests could open it and leave it unlocked. But because it was a sliding door, not equipped with a magnetic key system, there was no record of entry through the courtyard. It could have been that Maria Luisa let someone in through that door or left it unlocked and someone came in and killed her. It was the most logical version of events at the time. 
After the discovery of the body, the hotel staff called the police, who, in examining the scene, did not need to conduct a thorough analysis to establish that Maria Luisa Sidnio had indeed been murdered. Her body was completely damaged and it was obvious that she had been tortured and that the person who had done it was very angry. Forensic experts went to the scene to gather evidence, determine the manner of death, and analyze every detail in hopes of finding the culprit. It must be said that the level of brutality was so high that authorities recommended that the Sidneo family have a closed casket funeral. An autopsy conducted some time later revealed that the body had bites in several places and two fingernails were broken. This means that Maria Luisa was trying to defend herself. Another detail that came to light during the autopsy was that the killer had washed the body. In other words, after the murder, he carried Maria Luisa to the bathroom. According to the criminalist, the woman was killed in the bedroom on the bed, which is explained by the large amount of blood from there. This man took the body to the bathroom, washed it, then dried it, wrapped it in a sheet and placed it on the bed. It was in this way that the hotel staff later discovered the body of Maria Luisa. Although the killer had washed the body, perhaps in an attempt to get rid of the evidence and cover up the traces of the crime, it was almost impossible, as there was blood everywhere. It was on the floor, the walls, the curtains, and the bed. This made it even more certain that the attack was incredibly brutal. The experts took photographs and collected as much physical evidence as possible. The body was then submitted for autopsy, and police began interviewing hotel staff as well as guests who may have heard something. From what was seen at the scene, Maria Luisa must have been screaming violently and her dog barking. However, no one reported screaming throughout the night. Although the hotel was nearly empty due to the pandemic, there were a few people working at the hotel and the owner of the hotel, Harry Bowden, who lived there with his husband Dano, was always present. He also allowed some trustees to live in the hotel because they were having financial problems. This was also because the hotel was never full during the pandemic, so renting out a room to friends was not a financial loss to him. A bottle of wine she had ordered from room service and two glasses were found in Maria Lewis's room. Later, an examination of the victim's cell phone revealed that she had sent a picture of the two glasses to a friend, but there was no mention in the message that she was with anyone or that she was waiting for someone in her room. She also sent an audio message to the same friend. Mido, you have to see how good this hotel is. Mofalda is the queen of this place. I mean, they treat us very well. I paid for the all-inclusive package, which is an extra $100, and they bring me drinks, they bring me everything, strawberries, pineapple, basically anything I want. And Mofalda brings different treats and water. You have no idea how awesome it is here, and I mean, I love it. I danced with the bartender, with another guy, with the owner's assistant. The owner, by the way, is Dutch, so it's super cool. Mita, I'm paying 155,000 colons a night, and on the all-inclusive, I can order dinner from anywhere I want and they'll bring it to me. This hotel, of course, is a little shabby. More accurately, it's kind of run down because it's understaffed. The same girl who serves coffee, she also takes care of the hotel grounds. But I still really like it here. It's a very cool place. Later, when officers interviewed Maria Lewis's friends and relatives to see if she had any apparent enemies, authorities learned that she always ordered two glasses, even when she was completely alone. This was so that alcohol could be poured into one glass and water into the other. Hence, this confirms that the woman was alone and not waiting for anyone. And here we return to the first hypothesis. The attacker must have been someone who saw Maria Lewis in the hotel, noticed that the back door was open, and attacked her. But at the same time, so much of the brutality seemed to come from someone who had an intense hatred for her, was intensely angry with her. And that was what was hard to explain. In situations like this, it seemed like it was a murder, committed entirely by someone who really knew the woman and really wanted to make her suffer. But at the same time, there was no evidence that Maria Luisa was with anyone, or that she was seeing anyone. Another detail from the autopsy confirmed that the woman had also been abused. In addition, she had signs of strangulation, marks of blows on her cheeks, lips, arms, and chest. As a result of their analysis, review of the autopsy results, interviews with family and friends, and people at the hotel, authorities concluded that the attack could not have been carried out by a single person because Maria Luisa was not heard screaming. They then speculated that there were at least two attackers, and that they had subdued her in such a way as to completely control her. There was even talk that there might have been a third person because the woman had been abused. According to this theory, two of the attackers held Maria Luisa down and a third person raped her. All of this is supported by the fact that when the body was analyzed, there were no signs of ropes or anything that would indicate that the victim was bound. 
The officers also speculated that the men probably stuffed something in the woman's mouth so that she couldn't scream, or so that the screams wouldn't be heard, and so that they could carry out the attack without anyone hearing anything. The cause of death was ruled to be head injury, which could have been caused in a number of ways. It could have been caused by a violent blow to the head, it could have been caused by being undressed as there was evidence of fractured vertebrae, and it could have been caused by being hit by an object or falling heavily to the floor. All in all, what the assailants did to Maria Luisa, sitting down, was an atrocity, something senseless and with no obvious motivation. It didn't take long to find the first suspect, and all because the body of this man, who was staying at the hotel, showed numerous fresh wounds that looked like scratches and blows inflicted by a man trying to defend himself. This is what was analyzed. It turned out to be Tora Ira Martinez, an exotic dancer who worked in the city's nightclubs and was staying at the hotel at the time of the murder. The man was placed in a holding cell while attempts were made to link him to the case. His footprints were compared with footprints found at the murder scene, and two of them matched the man's footprints, which were located in front of the bed in the bedroom on the black porcelain floor. Shortly thereafter, a second suspect, Luis Carlos Miranda was apprehended when a hotel security guard reported seeing him walking the hallways at night with the first suspect. Since Tora was arrested, Luis Carlos had to be questioned to see if there was any connection between him and the case. In addition, tests were conducted and it turned out that his dental records matched the bites found on Maria Luisa's body. According to some testimony of hotel employees, they saw Maria Luisa talking to Luis Carlos, and on one occasion to Herrera, but in a casual manner, not as if they were acquaintances or friends. They simply greeted each other and asked how they were doing. This may be due to the fact that there were very few guests in the hotel, so they may have passed each other several times. I mentioned earlier that the owner of the hotel allowed two friends to stay on his property because they were having financial problems and were in the midst of a pandemic. Now, Luis Carlos and Teodora Herrera were those friends. Seeing the matching footprints and bite marks of these two suspects, the most consistent action of the police was to question Harry Bodden, who, as I said, was the owner of this hotel. In the course of that questioning, he revealed that on the day that the murder occurred, which was the night of July 19, 2020, Harry and his husband were having dinner in their apartment inside the hotel with the two suspects. After dinner, the four men went to a private pool. Harry then revealed that the two suspects worked for him in exchange for him allowing them to live there. Luis Carlos was in charge of the website on the marketing side, and Herrera worked as a cook and bartender. The owners of the hotel and these suspects were not close friends, but when they started living in the hotel already a year before the murder, they began to meet more and more often, going out for dinner, lunch and spending time together. Thus, a friendship developed between the four men. Although Harry Bowden cooperated by giving this interview in August 2020, he was arrested because two bites found on the victim's body also matched his dental records. And that's when the truth began to come out. The police confiscated the phones of all the detainees and found text messages between Luis Carlos and Harry Bowden, which were highly compromising. In these messages, Luis invited the hotel owner to have intimate relations with a woman while he was supposed to be watching. This correspondence occurred several days before the incident. The suspects claimed that the messages meant nothing and that they were just joking around. But that was enough for authorities, including physical evidence, to keep them in jail while they bill the case. The only one who wasn't arrested was the hotel owner's husband because there was no evidence. There were no text messages, no fingerprints, and the bites did not match those found on the victim's body. The suspect's defense tried to argue that the evidence in the form of bites found on the body was inconclusive and that essentially none of them were involved in the murder. But despite this, the three men were charged with the murder of Maria Luisa Saidio. Before the trial began, the lawyer for Harry Bowden, the hotel owner, asked that his client be released and placed under house arrest for two reasons. First, because there was a pandemic in the country and Harry was 69 years old and being in jail was risky. Second, he allegedly had difficulty walking due to recent knee surgery. According to the defense, the man had been walking with the aid of a cane for a long time, and when the trial began, he appeared in a wheelchair. Because of this request, he was placed on house arrest and was able to return to the hotel where he was staying. He couldn't leave the hotel, but he had everything he wanted while he waited for trial. He had a staff of servants, restaurants and a swimming pool. On September 13, 2022, the public trial of the detainees began, in which the evidence against them was heard. He was then that the prosecution had difficulty proving the involvement of Harry Botton and Luis Carlos. Recall that they were found to have text correspondence and allegedly bite marks on the victim's body. 
The problem was that the Bites couldn't actually prove who committed the murder, they could only rule out suspects. So all the hotel employees could be ruled out, but these two couldn't. So it didn't mean that the bite was an exact match to the dental records, so it wasn't conclusive evidence. But as far as Theodore Herrera was concerned, he had the most evidence against him. There was a blood trail. There were also wounds on his body that were found to have been inflicted by Maria Luisa when she tried to defend herself, as his blood was found under the victim's fingernails. Blood was also found on his shoes, watch and cell phone, which were in his room at the time of the search. Obviously, with this in mind, they were only able to convict Herrera, who received 50 years in prison, while Harry Bowden and Luis Carlos Miranda were acquitted for lack of physical evidence. Many believe that these two men were also involved in the murder because the hotel security cameras mysteriously stopped working on the day of the murder. This suggests that someone must have set this up in another person, a hotel security guard, was suspected. However, at the same time, he, as well as the other two individuals, could not be arrested due to lack of evidence. Strangely, he left for another country after the murder, although the police asked him to attend the trial as a witness. There are many more things about this case that make one think that there are more people involved. For example, two guests even told the police that the hotel had a power outage for many hours the night of the murder, and this may have been done intentionally. First, so that the security cameras wouldn't work, and second, so that the magnetic keys wouldn't work. Another strange detail is that the investigator searched the hotel owner's private office only nine days after the murder, which could have given him enough time to remove all the evidence. In addition to the text messages, the suspect's social media accounts were analyzed, and here conversations between them about some sort of fantasy were found that directly relate to how Maria Lewis's body was found. Obviously, from a legal standpoint, Harry Bodden and Luis Carlos Miranda are innocent and I am in no way accusing them. The only person in prison for this murder is Herrera, who is also awaiting a new trial to see if his sentence can be commuted. And although this case has been solved, the Sedino family believes that there is something else going on here, there is some kind of defense, some kind of cover-up. They said that the authorities handed them Maria Lewis's belongings drenched in blood and that they don't understand why this happened because they wanted to preserve this evidence in case something else was found. They are obviously satisfied with the verdict of Herrera, but not with the acquittal of Harry Bodden and Luis Carlos Miranda.